Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back. Good to see everyone this morning. And we're very pleased to welcome Tom back once again and Pam for the choir there. Always good to have you, both of you with us. In our announcements this morning, Chair Aerobics will not be this week since the Fellowship Hall is being taken over for Vacation Bible School. And also, I think it's that time of month, is it? Yes, Missions and More will meet tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Our scheduled speaker will not be able to come. She's going to be able to come in October. But we have a real treat for you. Ken and Linda Parker with Bedford Boys Tribute Center. They will be our speaker. So if you're a patriotic person and you love your country, be here tomorrow at 10 o'clock. I don't know if you've been to the Tribute Center or not, but it's a wonderful place. And they're going to tell us more about it. 10 o'clock tomorrow for Missions and More. Hope to see you. That should be very interesting. I encourage everyone that can to try to come. It should be really good. And also, uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we will be having Vacation Bible School here. And then Friday night, Friday afternoon, we will have a dinner for all of the uh, children and the parents and all of the teachers for Bible School. And all of you also. And yes, everyone is invited, so everyone can come. Are there any other announcements this morning? Well, it's good to hear that Connie's back home. I'm sure she's glad to be there. So hope, hopefully she can stay this time and not have to go back again. Any other announcements? But please stand and let's join together in an invocation found printed there in the bulletin. If you will please respond with the bold print. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flames scorch you. 
For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Syria in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed them as I have made them. Now, if you will, please turn to page 133. <laughs> we'll join together in leaning on the everlasting arms. Page 133. <laughs> We want to, at this time, to take our needs and uh, um, concerns to the Lord. I wonder, we know um, Deborah Powell, I mean, I don't know if some of you have heard, Deborah Powell had a fall in the night, and uh, she's okay, really, um, though, I mean, she's got a bummed up knee, uh, but hit her head, and uh, that's okay. Thankfully, but she's just kind of hurt and bruised. I don't know what the damage to her knee is. We haven't heard that, but anyway, we want to keep them in our prayers. Um, also, Connie Pageant is home from uh, her second surgery, and she's kind of weak and having some of the effects of the surgery still that she's dealing with. But um, I said I'm. Pr uh, she, I said, I'm praying for Charles, too, and she said, good, because he's, he's on diaper duty, whatever that is. I, <laughs> I mean, that, I said, well, there are worse things in life, but uh, that's a bad one, but any Kenny other May. things? Kenny May. Kenny May. Oh, Kenny, Kenny May. Kenny May. Yes. Is he, ha he's had surgery? Gallbladder removed. Pardon me? Gallbladder removed. Oh, yeah, he's recovering from gallbladder. Kenny May. Recovering from gallbladder surgery. Anybody else have something? 
I have to get close because my hearing <laughs> is close. Exactly. My hearing is close. <laughs> okay. I don't have any excuse at this point. All right. Um, uh, let's see. We'll do, we'll go to a prayer then. Um, I don't see that there's anything else to to announce. So let us take time to be in prayer. Quiet yourselves before the Lord. Remember who it is that we are speaking to. We have the privilege of God who has called us to come boldly to his throne because he's provided the way through the cross to speak with him. And so let us um, prepare ourselves in quietness now as we bring our own concerns to him. Our dear Heavenly Father, we extol you, our God and our King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day we will bless your name and praise you, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Lord, if we could only see into the minutest cell, we would see how intricate and complex one little teeny cell is all the functions that are happening like a little factory, like a big gigantic factory, I should say. And just one little cell with trillions of cells in each one of our bodies. Lord, we, we recognize that we cannot even fathom this universe. We, we can't plumb its depths and understand it. Our thoughts are not your thoughts. We thank you that you're the God who has, in all of this great wonder, is mindful of us. Who is mindful of man that he would care for him but you? And we thank you today, Lord, that you are very attentive to us. You have said you know every hair on our head. And Lord, uh, you're intricately and intimately aware of each one of us in our daily life. You know when we sit down and when we rise up, when we go out and when we come in, and we ask you, Lord, to bless our going out and our coming in. We thank you that each person in this room has um, uh, enjoyed life with you, and we are gathering together today to recognize you. We lift up to you, Lord, the concerns of our world. We ask for um, you and know that you're, you will thwart the counsel of the nations when they plot against you and against your own. Give us reassurance, Lord, that you do reign. Your dominion is... Uh, through all generations and your loving kindness endures forever. We, we ask you, Lord God, to um, be with our leaders of our country from our president and the cabinet and uh, the, the Supreme Court and the judges and uh, our Congress and all of the leaders uh, uh, across this country federal, state, and local, that, Lord, there will be a sense of repentance that, that where there is um, no fear of you, that there will be fear of you, that people will turn and recognize that you indeed are the God that transcends all powers and principalities. And we ask you, Lord, to bring revival 
and renewal upon our country. Whether it's from top down or bottom up, uh, blow fresh winds of the spirit and bring the things of God to the foremost attention of people. We think locally of our own big long list that we have. Um, and, and you see the names, Amelia and Barry Errington and Wayne Booth and Marie Bowling and Ronnie Epperson and Mac Hargis and Judy Holdren's family, Ada Johnson, Robert Mays, Etta Moya, Connie Pageant, Ella Pusey, Wendy Rogers, Winston Schuler and family, Joyce and Glenn Tyree, Peggy Worley, Hollis Yates, Kenny May, and Deborah Powell, Lord, we would want you to tailor, and know you will, tailor your administrations and your ministry and, and work to each of these according to their need. That in their distress, from one degree to the next, that they will be glorifying you and finding that you are near to them. For you are near. And you will not fail them, they'll forsake them. And all of our tears are in your bottle. You understand what each of these are going through and we ask that they will call on you with the heavenly power to bear upon their need. And they, some are so dependent on you and asking for us to pray and we join in them, with, with, join with them and with others in, in asking for your your power of heaven to be upon each of these. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. ask girls and boy, boy and girls, come on down. Look at these. You know, I've been away for a little while and come back and I hardly, I don't, they're two, they're different people. Well, that's great. Now, I'm going to show them a video. Um, you all can't, I'm sorry, I, I, you're not going to be able to see it, but I'm, I want you all to see this and see what these people are doing in this room in here. Uh-oh, it went away. Come back here. Where is technology when you need it? Okay. Well, I just had that thing up here. I'm so sorry. Tom, give us one of the kids. That's right. Give us what? One of the kids. <laughs> You're too old for this. Well, that one's. This is totally bad. Well, it's not totally bad. I mean, I don't know. Hold on a minute. If you should have seen Pam trying to do something with technology a little while earlier, it, but look, I, this may not come up, but you, you can see it was last Friday. Um, 
it was last Friday, last Friday when they were, these three were back in this room preparing for vacation Bible school. I videoed them along with some others back there. And I wanted to tell them that they were doing ministry back there because, look, they'd taken some time out of their day to come over here. They um, were going to prepare a skit that they're going to do at Vacation Bible School coming up starting Wednesday. So they came prepared to read their lines. They were going over the lines that they were going to say. They were, they were getting their costumes together, having a good time uh, doing that. And, and I wanted to say, you all were doing ministry. And it reminds me of a verse that I'm going to talk about later in the service where Paul tells us, the Bible tells us, to abound in the work in the Lord. Abound. That really means uh, do a work for him. Excel for him in ministry. And I wanted to tell you, you all were doing that. Uh, and you're, because you're going to tell, you don't maybe think about it, but I'm thinking about it. You're going to be telling the story of Jesus, a couple of stories of Jesus that are very important stories for people that might not have heard many stories like that, and might maybe for the first time. And um, so your, your, your practice and all of that is part of it. And I just want to say, Keep on doing that for the rest of your life, excelling in ministry. You were doing ministry. You're going to be doing it this week when you're in your play. I know it's fun. Is it fun? He's, he's going to be Jesus. And, and this uh, young girl here is going to be a, a Pharisee, if I'm not mistaken. Doesn't she? No, she doesn't look like a Pharisee. But she transforms herself into a Pharisee. Now, at least what are you going to be? Remind me. Oh, a tax collector. <laughs> well, your dad's a mathematician, so do those. He, he counts too, so anyway. All right, well, I wanted just to commend these three, and there were some others with them that were all getting ready for ministry. And I'll talk about some of the other older ones that were in there that were also ministering later. But um, anyway, remember what Paul says abound in the work in the Lord, abound, get A's. That's what it means, to excel, to get A's in the ministry for the Lord. Lord God, thank you for uh, these three here and their ministry to you and that they are already at a young age excelling in your work. Continue to bless them, we ask in the name of Jesus, amen. Now, we didn't need this video, did we? I'll show it to you another time.
Good morning. Good morning. Our Old Testament text comes from Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 14. Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of Pharaoh. Oops, I'm sorry. Let, let me start over here. Starting at 14, I don't think y'all want to hear the whole thing. Um, as Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. I'd like to, like to read from um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 58. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Lord God, we ask you to help in the transaction between in, in communication between the word being spoken and received. Be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, um, I want you to picture the overthrow of, your, of the king of terrors, death itself. As God sees it, it's already accomplished. Death is swallowed up in victory, he says here in the text. It is as good as being accomplished because God will do it. And more than that, Christ has already been raised from the dead. You too will be raised from the dead. So he basically says, knowing this, get on with it. Live your life in light of this fact that death will be swallowed up in victory, that Christ has been raised from the dead. You too, as a believer, will be raised from the dead. And so, therefore, hear this charge that the Apostle Paul wants to speak to, who he says... Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. Now, my message this morning will have two parts. A, to urge the effect to be steadfast, immovable, abounding in Jesus' work, knowing that your work is not in vain. And secondly, it is to say that the cause, death is swallowed up in victory because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Hang on just a minute. I've got to order myself here. Let's see. That's that. Okay. Yeah. Uh-oh. Now, um, let me take the second one first, which is, why are we to be steadfast and movable, abounding in the steadfast love of the Lord, knowing that we will be productive? Why do you do that? Because death is swallowed up in victory. The process of physical disintegration has been going on since Adam, and it's going to continue uh, to happen until 
physical disintegration is going to be swallowed up, says scripture. Swallowed up pictures the engulfing of something by waves so that it, the something no longer um, is there. It's gone away. Um, we remember, uh, or at least can remember, hearing about German U-boats striking terror in the, in the sea traffic lanes in 1916, back in uh, World War I. Uh, the submarines stealthily preyed upon innocent vessels uh, without mercy. Uh, the, the striking case was uh, the Lusitania was torpedoed by a U-boat and sunk, killing nearly a th over a thousand people. Well, on December the 13th, 1916, HMS Landru spotted a U-boat. And before the U-29 U-boat could submerge, it rammed it and then um, uh, uh, managed to drop several depth charges upon it. Later that night, the British noticed that there was debris and oil in the water, and the U-29 was no longer uh, seen again until that is in 2017 when a diving wreck archaeologist identified a U-29 off the coast of the Netherlands. But you see, the sea swallowed it up. Death is going to be swallowed up in victory so that you can say, and I'm going to say, death, you're done. John Dunn put it this way. I, I quoted it in one of my last times that I was here, but I love it so much. Death be not proud. Though some have called you mighty and dreadful, you are not so. For those whom you think you do overthrow, die not, poor death, nor yet can you kill me. One short sleep past, we wake eternally, and death shall be no more. Death you shall die. And the Apostle Paul is telling us, death will be abolished. Christ has been raised from the dead. That is the signal that your resurrection is on the way. And the first point is, are you living with the resurrection in front of you? Because Christ has been raised from the dead, it's a signal there is a resurrection coming for those who believe in Christ. It's up ahead. So that's the first thing. That is the reason then that Paul can say to the church and say to this church, beloved, because the resurrection is in front of you, the effect follows. Be steadfast, be immovable, abound in the work of the Lord, because your toil will not be in vain in the Lord. Because we have peeked behind the curtain of eternity and we know that God kills death, so then live your life in this way, in a certain way. Be steadfast. The word actually means, better put this way, become steadfast. <laughs> become steadfast. Brian's doing weightlifting right now with the, with the football players. And that's the idea. Develop your firmness like your biceps. Become settled in your faith. And you develop steadfastness on the way, on the journey. Seeing in each of the valleys of the shadow of death the Lord's deliverance so that you're ready for the next valley of the shadow of death because you're that much stronger. Now, so let me ask you, is there any fickleness? Is there any changeableness? Is there any eternal wavering in your relationship with Jesus Christ right now? Become steadfast. Look at Moses and the passage that Brian read. Moses and the, and the Israelites experience there at the Red Sea. God promises Moses and the Israelites, I will bring you to the land I swore to give Abraham. To give Abraham. So they've got that promise before them. On the Passover night, the Israelites walk free out of Egypt. And they see God's victory. 
and they think the next stop is the promised land. Wrong. The next stop is the Red Sea with the Egyptian army pressing down on them once again. Now they still have God's promise that says, I will bring you into the land that I swore to give, swore to give Abraham. They've just seen God deliver them on the Passover night. And is their faith firm in God? No. Because rather than plan on victory, they are say, they're planning their funerals. They're saying, were there not better graves in Egypt than out here? And Moses says to them, do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. Stand firm in your faith. Stand fast. God delivered you in, on the Passover night. He's going to deliver you tonight at the Red Sea. So each triumph, though, began to build more firmness. Firmness for believing the next triumph. And then you get to be like King David who said this. He said, I've been young and now I'm old and I have not seen the righteous forsaken. That's being steadfast. Become steadfast in your trust of God. Keep standing fast. Now the second thing that Paul does say is be immovable. <laughs> we could make a joke about churches being immovable, couldn't we? Um, uh, we've never done it that way for the last 75 years. Now sometimes we want to keep to the old ways that we've done it. But the point in this case is when he says be immovable, unmovable means do not give in to the threats to your faith. Let nothing move you from your moorings. Stand fast. Now the devil is the chief of bravado and bluster and intimidation. Martin Luther said his rage we can endure for his, lo, his doom is sure. I thought of Nehemiah, who was the leader in Israel after the Babylon captivity, and Israel's going back into the land and settling it, and Nehemiah oversees the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Well, he receives threat after threat after threat. Shemaiah warns Nehemiah, you better go into the temple because they are coming to kill you. Tonight, in fact, Nehemiah says, should a man like me run away? Should I run into the temple to hide? No, I will not go in. And it turned out they were blustering. They were in trying to intimidate Nehemiah from stop, in order to stop his building project. They didn't like it. So my word to you is do not be swayed by the mudslingers. And there are, are a ton of them coming at you right now. <laughs> a ton of mudslingers out there. You Christians are out of date, out of step, weak, unscientific, anti-intellectual, in, intolerant bigots, homophobic, full of hate and not love, and you're losers. You're just losers. Well, you remember what people called Jesus, Beelzebub, they called him the devil, and John Wesley they called a Bible bigot. So they're going to, yes, they're going to be calling you stuff. Be immovable. Be steadfast. Keep to your moorings. There's a scene in uh, the fantasy epic, the uh, Fellowship of the Ring, the Lord of the Rings. Frodo Baggins and his company has, has to go, they, they have exhausted all other routes and they have to go through the mountain in order to get where they're going. And they find themselves in Durin's Bane, deep in the mines of Moria. And they soon learn, here is the lair of the hideous monster Balrog. He's 60 feet tall. He's got this vicious insect-like face. And he's got horns like a gigantic bull. He's clothed in consuming fire. And he's moving to attack them. Blocking his approach is the gray wizard Gandalf that stands before Balrog and said, You shall not pass. And Balrog doesn't pass. 
Be steadfast. I've seen uh, over the last year, Bethany, you stand your ground. Well done. It's very gratifying to see. You've been immovable and kept to the faith once for all delivered to the saints. I'm grateful for you and your standing fast. Continue to be steadfast. Be immovable. Well, the Apostle Paul um, exhorts us further. He said, be steadfast, become steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding in the work of the Lord means be outstanding, excel for Jesus, get A's in ministry. Now, I know we've got so many teachers in this room that have, they have been getting A's and they've been giving A's all of their life. And so they know what A effort is, right? The Apostle Paul is, that's, that's what that means, is to excel, it's to do a work for the Lord in the Lord. Uh, this last year, I've had the opportunity to travel around to a lot of United Methodist churches who have been wanting to disaffiliate from the United Methodist Church. I have seen a work. It's been so impressive to see people like you all multiplied throughout Virginia, people with a human and ability, many people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, dedicated to the Lord Jesus, who will not stand for third-rate disobedience to God's Word and to the discipline, and with A, effort, energy, and personal money, they have pushed their churches to a better day. I've also seen in this charge just here this last week other examples. Uh, in the preparation for vacation Bible school on Friday, I had to be in there. I was a pizza delivery boy. And there are these beautiful children giving themselves to practicing their lines, choosing their costumes. They're going to tell about Jesus. Well, why is there even a vacation Bible school? Because I think there are some people that cannot sleep thinking that this younger generation might not hear God's word. They want to offer Jesus Christ. And so there the VBS workers were back in that room on Friday in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. We won't get too precise about age, but it, I'm thinking that's where the range was. It could have been 30s, 40s, and 50s. I'm not sure, but it could have been 60s, 70s, and 80s. There's one with a sprained ankle, one with a cold, one with a new hip. <laughs> one with low blood pressure, one who's revived from a stroke, and there they are, determined that the children will hear the things of God, his love and the salvation in Jesus Christ. I think they're excelling in ministry. So whatever things we Christians should be, thinking, speaking, and doing as Christians, we want to excel in them. So... We become steadfast, immovable, excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. The word toil here means labor, trouble. Work, we all know work. Uh, work is mental or bodily activity that expends energy toward a goal. Oftentimes work is done under stressful circumstances. It's either hot or cold. It's under time constraints, timelines, deadlines. You've got chapped lips or you've got a hangnail or something worse going on uh, usually. And you're dealing with people's self-esteem and their attitudes and their plans are on the line. And you're not oftentimes getting immediate results uh, from what you're doing. And one of the things you know is this is not leisure. <laughs> this is work. Thomas Edison worked hard to develop an electric light bulb in, to replace the gas light. And he needed to find the right substance for a filament. So it needed to glow well and last long and not burn up. So he tried one type of filament, and then he tried another. And when 
he tried it, he'd throw it out his window. And it, there was an increasingly high pile out his window because he worked with hundreds of materials. He finally had gone through a thousand possible filament possibilities. And on his 1001 try, he discovered carbon filament. It was a carbon filament that in an oxygen-free bulb, it glowed and it didn't burn up. Eureka. William Carey was an English shoemaker called the father of missions. He saw the need to take the gospel to the rest of the world. So in 1793, with his family, he set off to India to preach Christ. He labored year after year without seeing a convert. His son died of dysentery. His wife was having a mental deterioration. Finally, in his seventh year, he got his first convert and baptized him. We give a effort for the Lord. Even when we don't see results. And one, one, I was thinking of the missionaries on the island of Nias praying for a revival for 25 years. How long have we been praying for revival? Decades. The Apostle Paul assures us, your toil is not in vain. Vain means empty, without result, without effect. Be steadfast, immovable, excelling in the work of the Lord. It's going to produce results. Though oftentimes we don't see it immediately. I mean, how do you know what the Sunday school lesson did that, uh, that morning? Or what are the results of your praying with somebody? Or visiting somebody? Or taking them some food? Or talking with your skeptical neighbor about Jesus? If you're like me, it's easy to get discouraged because you don't see immediate results. I, in fact, I was talking with my, my neighbor who just recently retired. He was the band director uh, for years and years at Liberty University. If you saw the marching band, he was the, Stephen Kerr is the director. We were discussing our jobs. He worked with students and I worked with parishioners. And we both shared the frustrations that it's hard to measure. Uh, the results in jobs like these. So I've often thought I'm not like a contractor that can stand back and say, ah, there is the house I built. <laughs> well, you know, not long after our conversation, the UPS truck drove back, backed into our uh, driveway, and I, I thought, well, I don't think we've ordered anything. And, the driver stepped out and handed me this long box like this, not too, too wide, about like this. Well, I took the box inside, and, I, and Pam didn't know anything about it, so we decided to open it up, and inside were flowers. And there was a little card that said, we think of how you all were with us when Kevin passed away. That was 18 years ago. A black school principal retired in New Jersey and began a new life in, in, uh, just outside of South Hill in the country. And he felt the call to, to take up a ministry and become a pastor. So I got acquainted with him and kind of mentored him. And then he got pancreatic cancer. And before he could take his first appointment, he died. Pam and I were there with the family through their trial. But one plants, one waters, God gives the growth and the results, but he will bring the results at some point in time. So you and I, because we know the resurrection is in front of us, be steadfast, become steadfast. Let nothing dislodge you from the faith that once was all delivered to the saints. Don't shift the hope of the gospel. Always give yourselves to the interest of the Lord. Your labor is not without result. We know it because Christ's own labor is underneath us. Died on a cross, raised from the dead, and those with faith, he's forgiven their sins. He's given them new birth. He's given us the Holy Spirit, given them power over temptation, given us inner joy and peace. He's given us the assurance that he now reigns, and there's the resurrection in front of us to overthrow the king of terrors. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Christ Jesus our Lord.
So stand fast. Amen. Oh, yes, if you'll turn in your book to 888, your hymn book, we're going to um, do the affirmation of faith. I think, hopefully, it's 888. Oh, is this the right book? Mm -hmm. yeah. 888. Okay, yes, it is. Affirmation from 1 Corinthians 1. Good, this is a good one to do. Um, okay, if you've got 888, I'll be the leader and you read the people. This is the good news which we have received in which we stand. Everybody stand if you will, if you can. We'll do our affirmation standing. Uh, this is, if you can, this is the good news which we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved.
it's great worshiping with you today. And uh, you've been in the right place at the right time. You don't always know that, but you know it was today on Sunday in worship. Let me give you the final blessing. Now may the love of the Father, the grace of the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.